everyone, it's Jack from Cultaholic.com and it's time to take a look at another episode of Monday Night Raw. Now there was a big shocking heel turn this week on Monday Night Raw and several other things to talk about as well. The King of the Ring tournament continued to commence and we had a little bit more build in various storylines towards Clash of Champions. But obviously the question on everyone's lips is how good was Raw? Well there's only one way to find out and that is by assigning each individual segment a lovely individual grade. So without any further ado, this is Monday Night Raw graded. We start things off with that most beloved of wrestling tropes, a contract signing for the title match between Seth Rollins and Braun Strowman, with Michael Cole moderating proceedings. Now, contract signings often go a little bit wrong in wrestling, but I think if anyone can keep control over the situation, it's Michael Cole. Rollins says that he has defended two titles in one night before. That's not something that's new to him. He's got experience doing that. And Strowman says, yeah, we are going to defend our tag team titles against Robert Roode and Dolph Ziggler, but the problem is it's going to be really awkward when I beat you for your universal title. Awkward is the word he used there. Awkward. So if Strowman does beat Rollins at Clash of Champions, are we going to see him be like, ooh, it's a bit awkward, isn't it, mate? Sorry about that. It was a strange choice of words, but Rollins, to be fair to him, disagreed and said that he is going to beat Strowman because to win that universal title, he slayed the beast and now he'll slay the monster and keep hold of his belt. Slay the monster. Just threatened to kill his tag team partner, lads. AJ Styles and the club come out and crash proceedings. It looks like they're still part of this storyline going forwards. And Styles says, oh, isn't this super cute? Isn't this kawaii? He says kawaii as well because he used to wrestle in Japan. Do you see what he's done there? Uh, he basically says, this is ridiculous. Uh, I can't believe that Strowman has got a title shot just for looking at Seth Rollins' championship title belt. And he keeps on saying, lads, don't look at my title. No, 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 because that's how people get a title shot. He also points out, he flags up the fact that he doesn't have a challenger yet for Clash of Champions. Styles says if the club or the OC don't get what they want, then nobody gets what they want. And they all get in the ring. Michael Cole is like, gentlemen, this is a WWE Universe contract signing. Please do not get in the ring. AJ Styles just goes, Michael, shut up. And the crowd will go, yeah! There's a big pop for that. Uh, Styles then rips up the contract. It's not actually been signed yet. And he throws it in the air like confetti. And then Strowman immediately just flips the signing table and it kind of comically just buffs AJ Styles in the face. And he takes a lovely comedy bump as well. The baby faces clear the ring and we head to a commercial break leading into an opening tag team match. And that's your opening segment. I'm going to give it a B. Perfectly solid. And it helps keep AJ Styles involved in the universal title picture, which I'm always a fan of. So we come back from commercial break and we have Rollins and Strowman, the tag team champions, in non-title action against Gallows and Anderson, the OC, with AJ Styles watching on from the outside. This is a fairly slow-paced tag match, but a decent one as well. You know, I don't have any complaints. Nobody made any big mistakes or anything. And it looks like Rollins has the upper hand. It looks like he's about to win. He's made the hot tag to Strowman. Strowman's ran wild and got the upper hand for their team. Tagged Rollins back in, and now Rollins is like running through all his signature moves on Carl Anderson. But AJ Styles jumps up on the apron. Rollins goes to hit AJ Styles off the apron, but the distraction allows Anderson to roll him up for the one, two, three. And Carl Anderson gets a clean win. Well, a dirty win, but a massive win over Seth Rollins the universal no Rollins rolls Anderson up and gets the clean three count um sorry for getting everyone's hopes up there it's not nothing's gone that crazy yet on Raw AJ attacks immediately, crashing Rollins' celebration, and all the heels try and beat down the babyfaces, but the babyfaces take control of things. Strowman does his thing where he runs around the ring, just knocking people out of the way, but one of the people that he deals a big crunching shoulder charge to is Seth Rollins. He does the classic babyface, oh no, what have I done? That was a total accident. And that allows Ziggler and Rude to run down and jump Strowman. Now this big sort of super team of heels get all the baby faces into the ring. They hit Rollins with uh, Ziggler's super kick and Rude's glorious DDT. And then uh, they all hoist Strowman up together for a big super magic killer. That, that move just sounds silly, doesn't it, really? Styles finishes Strowman off with the phenomenal forearm and the heels all stand tall. Boo! I'm going to give this segment a B as well, similar to the opening segment. Solid action, not a lot like spectacular going on, but all perfectly serviceable stuff. Is this episode of Grade? Is this Raw going to be like the James Milner of Raws? Is it going to be like serviceable, does nothing wrong, and constantly just shows up, but nothing really flashy about it? But if you don't know, if you don't know who James Milner is, he's a hero of the English Premier League. 
Shortly after this segment, the club also attacked Cedric Alexander backstage mid-interview and just beat him down. And it's never really explained why, actually. They don't really have much history. I don't think they've got any history. But um, I think maybe it's just because the club are really hyped up still from beating down the baby faces in the ring, maybe. Because they're all kind of going like, yeah, no one stands in our way. I don't really, I don't really know where this is going. Next up, Bobby Roode, or Robert Roode, sorry, I keep doing it, and Dolph Ziggler against Zack Ryder and Kurt Hawkins. The crowd are pretty dead for this match, to be honest, but it's a perfectly fine tag match, pretty short, and the right team win. Ziggler and Roode continuing their momentum, heading into Clash of Champions. This gets a B minus, it was totally fine. In fact, it was pretty slick at certain points. They're all four good hands in the ring, but you're not allowed to say that a wrestler's a good hand, otherwise they cut the back of your head open with a steel chair, as we learned from Sean Spears in AEW. But this was a decent match. The right team won and it continues their momentum heading into Clash of Champions as I said it does get a B minus grade. Next up Lacey Evans versus Natalia in singles action but as Lacey's making her entrance first Natalia decides to jump her on the ramp. This is weird for two reasons. One, why? Like Natalia's a baby face why would she do that? She's all upstanding and honourable. Two, the way in which the attack was carried out was very weird. Like Lacey's doing her whole thing like oh here's my hand you can kiss my hand. No you can't you nasty. Natalia runs out from the back and it looks like she's going to hit her from behind but she just stops short and Lacey turns around like what are you doing and then Natalia hits her from the front so it's not quite a sneak attack but it still sort of is because she did it during her entrance. I don't really know what happened here. Was there a miscommunication maybe? I don't know. The match was okay however. Uh, Lacey looked pretty sharp actually. Sharper than she usually does which is a good sign. Maybe it was a good idea to pair her with someone as experienced as Natalia but it wasn't like a great match or anything. I'm going to give it a C plus because the finish was actually pretty good and I think kind of helps cancel out the weird opening and the weird behavior from Natalia at the start. The finish was Lacey Evans throwing a handkerchief into Natalia's face and then immediately following it up with the woman's right as Natalia was distracted or like disorientated. So that worked pretty well but again the, the start of the match was weird and then it was all fine and then the finish was quite good and altogether I think that does make a C plus grade but it's good to see Lacey Evans looking more solid in the ring I'll say that. Next up, the man comes around. Becky Lynch is here to cut a promo in the ring on Sasha Banks, who isn't there yet. But she does turn up. I've just spoiled it. She turns up later on. Don't worry about that. Uh, Becky says, you know what, Sasha? I listened to your excuses last week, your reasons for what you did. And I've got to say, they're all full of crap. While, uh, while you were the centerpiece of the NXT women's division, I was the sidekick. While you were being given showcase matches on Raw and SmackDown, I was struggling to even get on TV. And that's all true. I like when they play off real history to help it like further the intensity of a current feud. Becky says she was the afterthought while Sasha and Charlotte were paraded front and center. And the thing is, and I love this point, this really made the promo for me because I, I kind of agree with it as well. Becky was like, look where we are now. I'm the face of this company and you've just been away for like however many months. But with all your talent and with everything that you've got going for you, this should have been you. You should have been the game changer of the women's division. You should have been me. And I think that's a hell of a point. And to a certain extent, it rings true. But Sasha comes out and says, yes, yeah, she should have had all of Becky's glory and money and prestige and everything. But she hasn't got that. And the only reason that Becky's got that is because Nia Jax broke her face. And everyone goes, oh, that's a pretty good line as well, to be honest. Becky wants to fight right now because, of course, she does. That's what Becky Lynch does. But Sasha Banks says, you know what? I'm not doing anything for free in front of these people. I only fight for a paycheck and I want to match against you at Clash of Champions for your Raw Women's Championship and of course Becky Lynch accepts. Sasha says great I'm looking forward to it because the man is going to become the boss's bitch and because she says the word bitch you know it's an intense feud in WWE in 2019. This was a good segment I enjoyed quite a lot of what was said some of it was filler but some of the points really did hit home and had a certain truth and a weight behind them. So I'm going to give this a B plus overall, and I think it probably is one of the more memorable aspects of the show. Next up, King of the Ring action, Baron Corbin versus Cedric Alexander, with the winner heading on to the finals of the Raw bracket to head to Clash of Champions to face the winner of SmackDown. And Corbin, oh, he's still flirting with that throne and the crown and the scepter. He wants it so badly which makes me think it's not going to happen for him. This match has a classic storyline behind it, with Cedric as the smaller babyface, Corbin as the bigger heel, and Cedric actually carrying a bit of an injury into the match as well, after being beaten up by the OC earlier on in the night. Cedric's babyface comebacks are so, so good, and at various stages in this match, he gave me little glimpses, he reminded me a little bit of his excellent Cruiserweight Classic run, what, about three years ago now. Oh, is that how long ago the Cruiserweight Classic was? 
man. He even hits an amazing, like a huge Michinoku driver on Corbin at one point and comes close to getting the pinfall several times. But in the end, Corbin is just too much, catching Cedric with the end of days and progressing to the final of the Raw bracket. This gets a B plus. It was a good match. Maybe my favorite match on Raw from start to finish. Uh, Corbin looked pretty good. Corbin's doing all right in this King of the Ring run, isn't he? Sad to see Cedric crash out of there though, which is a bit of a shame. But if this leads to him getting a US title shot against AJ Styles, I'll be more than happy with that. Good match, good segment, B+, plus. let's go. Next up, the Viking Raiders versus two guys from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Legit. So the two enhancement talent guys, or jobbers, or whatever you want to call them, you know, whatever's polite to say, they get some mic time before the match. Uh, one of them says, yeah, you know, we thought we challenged the Viking Raiders because we did drive all the way here from Pittsburgh, referencing the rivalry between Baltimore, where Roy is, and Pittsburgh, where Roy is not. Uh, the crowd boo that. The other one, his tag partner, says, we're going to make the Viking Raiders look like a couple of Baltimoreans. Oh, hey, it's party time. Let's have a go. He actually botches the line slightly, which I felt bad about because he was clearly quite nervous but luckily that guy out of the two of them he bumped really well in the match they both bumped but they both did an all right job of being jobbers didn't they they both did all right better than better than certainly i or any of us non-wrestlers could have done so who are we to judge but the viking raiders win you're never going to believe it but they actually pick up the victory here in quick and comprehensive fashion it gets a c minus for me the funniest bit or the most entertaining bit of the whole thing was commentary Corey graves was just Oh, he, there was one part where he was saying that guy looks like Honky Tonk Man's son or Cole said that and then Graves was like no he looks like Honky Tonk Man's grandfather which, there were little funny jibes like that from Graves all the way throughout but the Viking Raiders picked up the victory and it gets a C- because I'm getting a little bit sick of these squash matches and also is this an unexplained babyface turn because the, the two jobbers were clearly heels so are the, are the Raiders now face for squashing them I'd, I'd want that to be ironed out a little bit more if we could just give the Raiders more promo time or more time to get them across as characters then I'm sure this issue would be solved. Next up the other King of the Ring match to decide who will meet Baron Corbin in the finals or in theory it's going to decide who'll meet Corbin in the final but we didn't quite get that did we? It's Samojo versus Ricochet. This was a great back and forth match it got given plenty of time as it should have been with Joe targeting Ricochet's legs to try and ground him and Ricochet fighting through the pain trying to win the match with quick little bursts of exciting offense. Joe eventually locks in the clutch while they're both perched on like one of the corners and Ricochet Ricochet throws both of them backwards, they crash down to the canvas and land with one arm across each other's chests for the double pinfall. WWE official John Cone has got to sort this out and totally bottles it to be honest. He doesn't have the confidence in himself to say yep it's a double count out, he doesn't know what to do, he doesn't understand the rules of the King of the Ring tournament in the event of a draw, which I always thought was that if you drew in a tournament in WWE then you were both eliminated and your opponent in the next round got a bye, but maybe that's only if it's a double DQ or a double count out, maybe double pinfalls are different, I'm not quite certain about that and neither is John Cohn he doesn't know what to do he consults someone on the headset in the back and then he walks to the back Ricochet is rightly like who won what the hell is going on and John Cohn says don't worry we'll we'll have a ruling soon he walks to the back Joe just blindsides Ricochet from behind Ricochet actually gets the better of Joe in this little brawl which is nice to see for Ricochet uh, and I'm gonna give this segment a B plus I was the match was heading towards a minus maybe even a grade territory but the finish did confuse things a little and deflate things a little as well so it gets a B plus a little bit later on it's revealed that Corbin will have to face both Joe and Ricochet next week to see who goes on to the King of the Ring final at Clash of Champions and obviously Corbin's not very happy about this and to be honest, I don't know if I'm too thrilled about it either. I mean, I'm assuming, and this is, I'm assuming a lot here, but I was assuming that Ricochet was going to win this raw bracket and go on to meet possibly Andrade in the final of the King of the Ring tournament. So for that to happen, Ricochet would have had to go through Drew, then Joe, then Corbin. I thought that was a nice natural progression. You know, he's beat two big scary dudes and then a third big scary dude, but one who isn't above cheating like all the time. So I thought that was a nice way of Ricochet getting to the final. But now instead, if he does win, this is assuming a lot, he'll have had to have be uh, Drew and then Joe and Corbin in a triple threat match which doesn't have quite the same snap to it in terms of booking I don't think but then again maybe that's not what's happening maybe they want Joe to go to the final maybe they want Corbin to go to the final I don't know I'm assuming quite a lot but the long and short of it is I really enjoyed the match the finish took a little bit away from it for me next up it's the Firefly Funhouse and Bray Wyatt says oh what the Fiend did to you Finn Balor was super duper rude and I'd like to apologize <laughs> I've not paraphrased that that's not me being oh little Jack the Jobber and all no no he literally said what happened to Finn Balor was super duper rude and I want to say I'm sorry it's so good this gimmick is so good but Puppet Vince is here and he tells off Bray Wyatt for challenging either Rollins or Strowman to a match at Hell in a Cell 
and, and why it's like, I'm sorry boss, and the puppet's about to fire him, and then Wyatt goes, no, look what I've been making, and it's money. And he feeds a dollar bill to the puppet of Vince McMahon, and the puppet eats it in, I can't do it justice, but the puppet eats this dollar bill in such a hilarious way. Vince, the puppet Vince, is satisfied and like, goes away and now Wyatt says you know what Rollins and Strowman aren't a good team they're selfish but I've realized that teamwork is really essential and then all the cast of like the Firefly Funhouse pop up around him Ramblin' Rabbit's there with a sign that says help and he kind of pushes him out of shot which is hilarious a great little touch and then Wyatt says my team helped me cope with the pain but the fiend helps me inflict it see you in hell oh what an excellent promo. This gets an A-, minus. not the most effective Firefly Funhouse segment we've seen, but certainly one of them. I really enjoy this, A-, minus, and I cannot wait to see The Fiend in action again. Next up, Cesaro versus The Miz in singles action, and it's pretty short, about five minutes or so. Cesaro charges Miz at the bell with a big uppercut, and then it develops into a really back and forth contest with both guys reversing a lot of each other's signature moves. It looks like Cesaro might have the match won when he rolls The Miz up, and it's like one, two, Cesaro grabs the ropes, the extra leverage, and the referee spots it. If you just hadn't grabbed the ropes, Cesaro, you might have won. Maybe you could feel that the Miz was about to kick out beneath him. Anyway, it kind of did end up costing Cesaro the match as Miz was later able to hit the skull crushing finale and pick up the victory. I'm gonna give this a C plus. The match was fine, I quite enjoyed the match. That's not my issue here. My issue is with the booking. I understand that Miz has to look strong heading into Clash of Champions and that's totally cool. So why did he wrestle, of all people, Cesaro? I don't think Cesaro was the right opponent here at all because Cesaro had that excellent match with Ilya Dragunov at NXT UK TakeOver Cardi and it was a really close encounter and Cesaro eventually ended up picking up the narrow victory and it made Dragunov look really strong in defeat. But now for Cesaro to then head to Raw and lose to The Miz in about four or five minutes, does that make Dragunov look weak by association? Does that make the entirety of the NXT UK division look weak? I'm not, maybe not Walter, but like everyone on Dragunov's level or below. And finally, the main event of Monday Night Raw, a women's division championship showcase pitting the Raw and SmackDown champions Becky Lynch and Bayley against the tag champions. Champions, Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross. But during the opening stages of this match, it doesn't take very long before Sasha Banks makes her presence felt. Her music hits and she walks out on the ramp and she doesn't like charge the ring or anything, but she just watches, staring a hole through Becky Lynch. The match goes on for a little bit, maybe about 10 minutes or so. Nothing of particular note happens, but everyone's getting a good little bit of offense in. And then Becky Lynch looks like she's on top. She looks like she's about to turn the tide of the match in her team's favor. So of course, that's when Sasha Banks slides in and nails her from behind with with the backstabber. Sasha beats down Becky with the chair and it looks like this is gonna be the final image of Raw. Sasha Banks standing tall over her opponent for Clash of Champions, but instead Bailey gets in the ring and takes the chair from her best friend, from Sasha, and stops her and says, don't. And then slowly, Bailey's facial expression changes and she nails Becky Lynch with the steel chair and the crowd just go crazy. Bailey has turned heel. I'm gonna give this a B plus. It was a good heel turn. The crowd responded very, very well, and it's really refreshing for Bailey at a time when she desperately needs a change of character. So that's really good. The only thing is, what's gonna happen for Bailey versus Charlotte Flair at Clash of Champions? That's gonna be a big heel versus heel match now, which could be fine, but I'm a little bit worried about the dynamic of that upcoming bout. But on the whole, I'm excited to see what happens next with Sasha and Bailey, who are, you know, best friends and everything and have been for a long time despite their fallouts and stuff. Now they're both on the same page, now they're both heel. I am really excited to see where this goes. Overall, I'm gonna give this week's Raw a B. Uh, there were some, well, one or two big moments. The heel turn was the only real big thing of note, of course it was. But uh, the King of the Ring tournament progressed with some good matches, and I'm looking forward to several matches at Clash of Champions as well, thanks to the build throughout several storylines on Raw. So it wasn't like a groundbreaking roar apart from the heel turn to Bailey, but it was a solid roar. A solid one, a decent one on the road to Clash of Champions. And next week, of course, it could be either a total car crash or an amazing roar because it's in MSG for the first time in so long and Steve Austin is gonna be on the show. Thanks very much for watching and let us know what you think in the comments section down below. You can follow Cultaholic on Twitter at Cultaholic and on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Cultaholic. If you enjoy what we do, then please do check out our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic, where you can pledge. And don't forget, of course, most importantly of all, to hit subscribe and to join us.